Yeah, I'll just take a moment. You know, we, have all, we always thank the worship team, you know, but there's hundreds of people serving all over the building. You know, the ushers and the greeters, the guest services. There's like 150 people in Kingdom Kids right now. There's like 30 people just in the back hallway making all the cool stuff happen. And uh, can we just give them a round of applause, you know, for serving so that we can worship? You know, it's great. You know, we talk about the giving family, but the serving family is truly the heart and soul of church, you know? And uh, so thanks to all you awesome people. Amen. All right, well, you can see here, we are continuing today this series called The Missing Peace. And um, it is a very personal series to me. Uh, it is some peace was something I struggled with for a long time in my life. And um, it always made me think. The Bible, when you open it up, you see all over the place this thing called the peace of God. And you see when you read the Bible that peace has been declared over the earth. But myself and so many others have lived outside of peace. And it would bother me, it burdened me, obviously for myself, but then I went on a, a journey studying how to build the peace of God into my life. And I can tell you that I overcame a lot of things in my life, but it would still bother me and, uh, you know, righteously bother me and, and uh, burden me to meet with people and talk to many of you and to hear how children of God are struggling with panic, with anxiety, with being overburdened, overstressed, being uh, uh, worried, struggling with insomnia, living in depression. And yet we know that there is this thing called peace. And in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was born, by the command of our heavenly Father, the angels declared, what did it say? And now there is peace and goodwill toward men. Right? So the moment that Jesus was born, our heavenly Father declared peace on earth toward men. So then why is it that so many children of God live without peace? I believe that it's because the peace of God is one of the most misunderstood gifts that God gave us as children. And because we don't understand it, we don't know how to build it into our lives, therefore we don't enjoy the benefits of the gift God gave us. The first thing you need to understand is that what I told you last week is that God said there is peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And I told you that word toward in the literal text says it is coming from God to you and it will remain in place for eternity. What that means is that there is nothing you can do, nothing you have done, will do, or ever do that will change the reality that God looks upon you and the mood from God and the gift from God towards you is peace and goodwill. And there's nothing you can do to change it. Even when I mess up, even when you mess up. God knows you're going to mess up. God knows you're going to be a little crazy from time to time. Some of you might have gotten a little crazy in the traffic this morning. I got a little crazy this morning when I got here, and I was like, nobody's going to be at church. I can't believe this. How dare they do this on a Sunday? It's going to be me and Ezra all by ourselves. <laughs> Ezra will lead worship to me and I'll preach to Ezra. <laughs> Better say amen. <laughs> I was just talking to Ezra, guys. <laughs> I had to tell myself, knock it off, Jared. Knock it off. Stop it. Even when you mess up, no matter... What happens in your life from your heavenly father to you is peace and goodwill. And there's nothing you can do, nothing your family can do, nothing the government can do, nothing your crazy cousin can do, nothing your lunatic ex-husband can do, nothing, 
nobody or no one can do, including yourself, to change that God looks upon you and has poured out his peace onto your life. So then that begs the question, what is peace? Right? What is it? Well, we're going to put it on the screen to review a little bit. The first thing that the peace of God is, is that it is tranquility of your heart and mind. It is tranquility of your heart and mind arising from reconciliation with God. Feel free to get your phones out. Take pictures of that if you want. Also feel free to post it on social media so that people can see the truth of what God has done. Amen? And God declared peace, and the first thing he declared was tranquility of your heart and your mind arising from reconciliation through Jesus Christ. So the source of your tranquility, your calmness, your peace within your heart and your mind is that you have been made right by Jesus Christ. Simply put, Jesus on the cross paid the price for you to now be accepted into the family. He balanced the ledger. You, we, humanity owed a debt to God for sin, and Jesus came in and paid the debt. And what did he say while he was on the cross? It is paid in full. What that means is you owe nothing to God. Jesus paid your balance. He paid the bill for eternity. And now you can stand right with God accepted into his family. That means that all the sin, all the shame, all the regret, all the guilt, and all the hurt and foolishness of your past can be washed away and you can stand here set free by the blood of Jesus Christ, accepted into his family. And you don't have to live in your past, you can live in your future knowing that you are the child of the Most High God. And you can go to bed at night with peace in your heart and mind. And because you have that peace and goodwill coming from God to you, it gives you the second definition, and that is that you get to live with a divine sense of favor from God and with God. And what is God's favor? It is his grace, his unearned undeserved, unmerited favor from God and with God. And it is his divine empowerment on your life. And because you have been set right in the eyes of God, you have been made right with him. Romans 5, 17 says that you stand in an abundance of grace. And because you are right in the eyes of the Lord, you can wake up each and every morning knowing that God's favor and empowerment is on your life. You can go to work tomorrow and walk into that conference room and God's grace is going to meet you in the room. You teachers can go tomorrow and wake up in the morning knowing that his grace is going to meet you in that classroom. You doctors can know that God's empowerment and favor is going to meet you in the operating rooms. You students can know that you're going to walk into those classrooms and God's favor will be there waiting for you to give you the strength, the wisdom, the empowerment to do anything that God has placed in your path to be successful because it leads you. See, his favor leads you to the third definition, and that is that you live in health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Health of what? Spirit, soul, and body. To do what? So that you can live well. Welfare. So that you can live well. The healthier you are, the better you're living. Amen? And the better you're living, the more prosperous you are. And the more prosperous you are, the more good you're having in life. Health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. And that comes from God's favor. God's favor produces a mindset in your life that you can expect from him every day, every month, every year of your life from him to you and nothing can change it. Health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Health, welfare, 
prosperity, and every kind of good. Why don't you say it with me? Health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Why am I being so redundant? Because I need you to understand that no matter what's going on in your life, in the best of times, in the worst of times, that when you get into that moment when the enemy has tried to attack you and your family, that you know that the attack is from the devil because if it's not good, it's not from God. And if it's not healthy, it's not from God. And if it's poverty and lack, it's not from God. And if it's not prosperity, it's not from God. So when the devil comes, you can stand there and know I have favor with Jesus Christ and nothing the enemy can bring into my life can overcome the divine empowerment and favor that Jesus came and was gifted to me the moment that he arrived on this planet. And family, we see this darkness, but we're going to go through the darkness. We're not going to live in it because health welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good is guaranteed into my life. And this situation will not rob me of what God has done for me through Jesus Christ. Why? Because health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Now say it like you believe it. Praise the Lord. See, you've got to know where you stand. You've got to know who you are in Jesus Christ. Because when the worry comes, and the anxiety comes, and the panic comes, and the pressure comes, you've got to remember what God has done for you. And that health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good provided through the favor of God because I am reconciled through Jesus Christ is the gift that God has given me. And no matter what I face, I will not be robbed of my faith. I will not be robbed of my peace. I will not be robbed of my joy because health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good is coming from my heavenly Father to me, my family, my church, my city. That is the gift from God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And the next definition is that it is the end of hostilities. Simply put, church, God's not mad at you. He's not going to be mad at you. He never will. Even in your worst moment, he's not mad at you. No matter what you do, you can't change the fact that he just loves you. He's not mad at you. The Bible says he poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross. That Jesus bore the curse of sin and death so that you could be free from it. God's not mad at you. Amen. Then we saw last week that everywhere in the New Testament that the apostles wrote, and may the God of all peace be with you, that the definition changed in that moment. And it is the God of all peace. The God who is the author of all blessing be with you. And how can God, the author of all blessing, be with you always? Well, simply put, is because Jesus who is crowned the prince of what? Peace. And the prince of peace lives on the inside of you. So the prince of tranquility of your heart and mind, the prince of favor, the prince of health, the prince of welfare, the prince of prosperity, the prince of doing good, the prince of, of, of not being angry, of forgiveness, and the prince of all blessing lives on the inside of you. Every moment of your life, the prince of peace is inside of you, and that is your direct connection to your heavenly Father to receive the gift of peace in your life. Amen? Now turn with me 
to Philippians chapter 4. You glad you came to church? So I told you last week that we were going to go macro to micro. So today we're going to get into the micro. And I'm going to start teaching you this week and the next two weeks how to build the peace of God into your life. There will be many of you who will overcome anxiety. You will overcome uh, 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 unforgiveness. You'll overcome shame. Many of you come in here each and every week carrying a burden that you don't have to carry. Some of you suffer from insomnia, panic attack. And I'm telling you that in the next, today and in the next two weeks, you will learn how to arm yourself to overcome. And you will begin to build the peace of God into your life instead of accepting the panic of the world. And a lot of you in the next few weeks will have a renewed sense of joy, a renewed sense of peace, a renewed sense of strength, and a renewed sense of hope. Your marriages are going to get better. Your relationship with your kids are going to get better. Your attitude at work will get better. And you will live with tranquility in your heart and mind. Why? Because you will be armed with the knowledge and the ability to build it into your life. How many of you would like to not have peace missing? You would like to have a fullness of peace in your life. Philippians 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Listen, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through who? Through who? Christ Jesus. So we talked last week that the peace of God is a gift given to you and it is a tool given to you by God to use as a defense system to guard your heart and your mind. And the first thing I need you to understand is that there is a daily battle going on in your life. And the battle is for rule of your heart. It's for rule of your heart. Why? Or l l let me back up. The enemy wants to come into your life with worry and stress and burden and anxiety to get you to step out of the peace of God. Ultimately, he wants you to lose heart. Jesus came, and in the Gospels, Jesus said to take heart. Everywhere that you see Jesus speak, where in the King James and New King James, where it says be of good cheer, or it says to take courage. How many of you have seen Jesus say that, right? Be of good cheer. Take courage. Everywhere that Jesus said that, in the literal translation, it says take heart. Take heart. Did you know that you can lose heart? But if something can be lost, what can it be found? You can lose heart, but you can also take heart. So that begs the question. Is there an area of your life that you have lost heart? Maybe on your job. Maybe in your marriage. Maybe with one of your children that you have lost heart. What does your heart mean? What does your heart represent? Your heart represents your passion, your zeal, your excitement, your hope, your expectation, your convictions. Your passion represents who you really are. Your heart represents who you really are. But it is what encompasses your dreams, your excitement, your energy. And you know you can lose heart. The world has even created cliches to describe it, right? You've heard the cliche, oh, his heart just wasn't in it. Or, oh, they gave a half-hearted effort. See, losing heart starts to produce words and phrases like, oh, what's the use anyway? 
Maybe you've lost heart on your job. Maybe you've gained a little extra weight and you've just given up. Nobody amens when you start talking about it. <laughs> We amen the head and not the tail, and I can do all things. We don't amen that stuff. <laughs> Have you lost heart? I believe that you will learn in the next couple of weeks how to take your heart back. See, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of your life. So Jesus says, priority number one, you need to guard your heart. And what did he give us to use to guard our heart? His peace. But he says, above all else, you better guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of your life. Did you know that what is in your heart will produce what you deal with in your life? Let's think about that. What's in your heart becomes the predominant focus in your mind. What becomes the predominant focus of your mind will be what comes out of your mouth. And the Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So if you're speaking death in your life, it's because poverty has come into your heart. Your heart's not healthy. Right? And you've got to guard your heart. You need to take heart. See, the devil knows he can't actually defeat you, so what he's trying to get you to do is to lose heart. Because it, when you lose heart, you start to quit. When you lose heart, you start to resign. When you lose heart, you start to give up. When you lose heart, you go to work without energy and excitement. You go to work with a bad attitude. Well, my boss is a jerk. Well, are you living your life for your boss or are you living your life for the glory of your king? Who are you here to please? Who are you here to represent on this earth? Did the Bible say that you represent your boss or did the Bible say to go out and represent Jesus Christ? We serve the King of Kings. Well, my marriage isn't what I expected it to be. Well, how about we start changing that? And let's get it back. Don't resign. Don't lose heart. It's time to take heart. Why? So you can be of good cheer, so you can have courage. Amen? Amen? So then that begs the question, how do we build heart or build the peace of God into our lives? Well, that is that we learn how to win the battle. See, when I say that there's a daily battle for control of your heart, what I'm really saying to you is there's a daily battle for control of your life. So here's the question. Who has rule of your heart? When opposition and challenge comes into your life, do you run to God or do you run from God? Who has rule of your heart? Well, today I'm going to teach you to understand the battle, but I'm going to arm you with the gifts to win the battle. Next week I'll teach you how to control your mind. How to get it, you know, your mind go a little crazy. How to get control of it. So we'll guard our hearts and our minds, and out of our heart and minds comes the issue of our lives. Okay? So how to win the battle. Number one, we're going to put it on the screens. Winning the battle for your heart. You must reject the contrary voices. You must reject the contrary voices. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. Deuteronomy 1, verse 28. Let me set the stage for this story a little bit. This is talking about the nation of Israel. At this point, Moses has led them out of captivity, out of bondage from uh, Pharaoh and the, in Egypt, they have gone through the wilderness and they are at the border of the promised land. The land that God promised to give them. They have sent 12 spies into the land. Many of you know the story. 
two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, let's go take the land. Ten of the spies came back and they allowed fear to come into their lives. And they gave a negative report. Now please understand, ten people turned the hearts of three million people. Look what they said in verse 28. Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. They said the people are greater and taller than us. The cities are great and fortified up to the heavens. Now, is that a little ridiculous or what? To the heavens? Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakin there. There I said to you, listen, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you. And according to all he has already done in Egypt before your eyes. See, the nation of Israel, God delivered them through endless miracles and he brought them right to the precipice of his promise. They're right there. I mean, it's like, all they got to do is, ah, but they don't do it. And guess what happens? They turn around. There's the promise. It's right there. Hi, pretty promise. <laughs> Land that flows with milk and honey. Why? Because they listened to the contrary voice. And isn't it amazing? You come to church. Charles Neiman gets you all pumped up. I can do all things. Wow. And then you go out there, and your fourth cousin's out there. I'm going to open that business that I had a, a plan for and I've dreamed of it. Where are you going to get the money? How are you going to do that? Nobody in El Paso makes any money. The contrary voice. I'm going to forgive my husband. What if he hurts you again? The contrary voice. And God's trying to bring peace and health and welfare and prosperity and good things. And isn't it, it's amazing though, right? You're going along in life, and you're about to step into the promise. And here comes the, co the contradiction. What are you going to do? Are you going to push through it? See, you have to understand that the system of the world is a system of negativity, cynicism, doubt. And it's all designed to just get you to turn away from the promise. To turn away. It's right there. There it is. There's the dream to go back to school. There's the dream to open the business. There's the dream for forgiveness in your relationships. It's right there. You can taste it. You can smell it. You can feel it. And what report are you going to believe? Are you going to live with the divine sense of favor that God has for you, knowing that health, welfare, prosperity, and good things is coming from him to you? Or are you going to believe your fourth cousin that has never amounted to anything in his life? Who are you going to believe? And isn't it amazing how ridiculous negativity is? The cities are fortified to the heavens? To the heavens. I mean, I don't know about y'all. I've seen some tall buildings. But like, have you ever seen any to the heavens? But that's exactly what negativity does, right? Oh, everybody, everybody's talking about us. Well, don't you know that everybody thinks this? You know, I've done research on these everybody's. I've noticed that a big everybody is three people. <laughs> Normally, the everybody is maybe two people. It's the person talking to you 
and their friend. And even the friend's like, uh, I mean, not really everybody. It was just a conversation we had at lunch. Everybody. Nobody in El Paso has any money. Am I the only one tired of hearing that? I was at the Chihuahua game last night. Me and 10,000 other people. Took me 20 minutes to get a hot dog. A $9 hot dog. But nobody has any money. I drive by Silla Vista Mall today. It'll be backed up to the, to the gateway. But nobody. Right? It's ridiculous. Everywhere you look, there's negativity. And it's all designed to get rule of your heart. To bring anxiety, to bring worry, to bring fear, to bring doubt, but mostly to get you to step away from the promise of God, the peace of God, the favor of God, the prosperity of God. And if the devil can get you to, like the nation, just turn around and just walk away from it. Those poor people went back out in the wilderness for 40 years. The whole generation died. And their children finally came back and took the land. They could have done it 40 years before if they had just rejected the contrary voice. You have to determine that you are going to stand on what Jesus says about your life and not stand on the cynicism and the negativity of the world. It is all designed to just get you to step out of the promise that God has for you. Number two. You must settle the shame crisis in your life. You've got to settle the shame crisis. Shame. Shame is one of Satan's greatest tools to rob you of your peace and to rob you of your future. Why? Shame gets you to live in your past. It is 100% past focused. And here is the progression. Shame is born out of sin. Sin is something you do. Guilt is something you feel from the sin. Shame is a burden that you place on your life. Sin is something you do. Guilt is something you feel. Shame is something you wear. What does the world say? Shame on you. Shame on you. Please don't say that to your children. Shame on you. Shame on you. We even have our kids read a book about it in elementary school. Right? The Scarlet Letter. We are teaching our children that if they mess up, they have to live the rest of their life identified by their sin. But that is contrary to what Jesus said. But so many people, so many children of God, and maybe a lot of you in this room, are still weeping and still crying and still burdened and still broken and still struggling. And you lay in bed at night and cry yourself to sleep over stuff that happened two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty, thirty years ago. And you have allowed the world to put shame on you. But Jesus said that you can have tranquility in your heart and mind because you have been set right with him. And Jesus said on the cross that he bore the shame of the world so that you can live without shame. See, the world says shame on you. Jesus says shame no more. So if Jesus said you can live without shame, at what point in your life are you going to decide to stop letting what happened in your past define who you are today? See, shame says that what Jesus did on the cross isn't good enough for me. You catch that, right? See, shame is self-condemnation. 
And Jesus said, there is now no condemnation to those who believe. But here's the progression. When you live in condemnation, you live with a sense of uselessness. What do we do when we condemn a building? We say it is not fit for use. And that's what the devil's trying to get you to think. See, the devil wants you to think because you lied, you are now a liar. Because you failed, you are a failure. Because you quit, you are a quitter. And Jesus says, I see all that, I wash it away, and you are not a liar, you can speak the truth. You are not a quitter, you are an overcomer. You are not a failure, you will live victorious. Because I will make you prosperous. I will bring welfare into your life. In Galatians 5 verse 1, it says Jesus came to give you liberty so that you can live free. Shame is a burden that you don't have to carry anymore. And my prayer for you today is that you will leave the shame of your past in this room today. And you'll stop beating yourself up over the divorce, over the abuse, over the pain, over the failed business, over the mistakes you made. Because God himself said that he washed away your past. So if God's washed away your past, why don't you let it go? It's time to move on from it. And leave that unnecessary burden in this church today. Jesus said that you are free from the yoke of bondage. You're free from it. So be free in the name of Jesus. Number three is, that's good, huh? Uh, what's number three? There it is. You must overcome disappointment. My notes are all messed up. No idea where I'm at, so I'm just going to talk. You must overcome disappointment. Let's understand what disappointment is. The Bible says that unrelenting disappointment makes the heart sick. The peace of God will guard your heart. Unrelenting disappointment makes your heart sick. In other translations, it says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Well, that makes sense, right? Because disappointment is the antithesis of hope. What is hope? Hope is a positive expectation. What is disappointment? Well, disappointment is a failure of expectation. Right? Right? You had an expectation, it failed, and now you're disappointed. Right? Every time, please understand, every time your life comes to a situation of disappointment, your life is at a crossroad. And you have to choose in that moment that you will run to God and grab onto hope or you will run away from God and allow the enemy to rob you of your hope. See, a lot of times when disappointment comes, we don't run to God, we question God. But questioning God doesn't get you the results that you need from God. Running to God gives you the opportunity to have hope restored, peace restored, wisdom restored, joy restored, and strength restored. Or you can take the wrong path on the crossroad, and you can live a life of disappointment, a life of discouragement, a life of frustration, a life that leads to bitterness, to worry, to panic, a life of poverty instead of welfare, and you can live disappointed. Now, please understand, it says unrelenting disappointment. Guys, it's not talking about the freeway being closed and it's a little inconvenient. We're talking about you wake up at 2.30 in the morning and you see your teenager coming in the house drunk. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's talking about the dudes in New York get greedy and you get laid off in El Paso. That's disappointment. It's talking about you walk out of work one day and your tire's flat. You get it changed to drive home and your, water's got, your house got four inches of water because the, the water heater broke. And how are we going to pay for all this? 
You know what I'm saying? It's not talking about that at Outback they got your steak a little too cooked. <laughs> Who cares? You know what I'm saying, right? And how you deal with disappointment will determine where your life goes. Let me tell you something. If you get anything out of this today, get this. You cannot control what happens to you, but you can control what happens in you. And what happens in you will then determine how you respond to what happens to you. And the devil wants to bring disappointment into your life to rob you of your hope. Because if he can rob you of your hope, guess what he then robs you of? Your faith. And if he robs you of your faith, he'll rob you of your victory. Because faith is the thing that brings substance to the things you hope for. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So disappointment is brought into your life by the enemy to get to to get you to let go of hope which means you let go of faith which means you step out of the victory that Jesus paid for you on the cross and you live a defeated life but that is not the promise that God has for you he said in Hebrews 4 verse 16 that hope is the anchor to your heart and your soul and in the message bible it says no matter what goes on don't let go of hope. Grab onto it with two hands, for it is your lifeline to the gateway where Jesus, to the throne room where Jesus sits as your high priest. But don't let disappointment rob you of your positive expectation. Because disappointment causes you to live what number four says, a life where you are overwhelmed by the life. And the fourth thing is you can't get overwhelmed. Back to the nation of Israel. They're standing there and the Philistines are there. And there's this big new dude named Goliath. And the nation of Israel won't even fight. They're hiding from one guy. And what does David say? He comes up. It's a teenager. He goes, what y'all doing? Jared Neiman translation. Because <laughs> David's from Texas. So it's, what y'all doing? <laughs> and what did David say? Listen. He said, do not let your hearts fall because of him. See, the devil just wants you to see the size of the challenge. To see the depth of the hurt. And he wants your heart to fall. Because if your heart will fall and you'll live without hope anymore and you accept disappointment as the rule of your heart, your heart will become sick. And if your heart will fall, you won't fight. Now listen to me, I have no idea what some of you all have been through. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. Some of you all have been through hell, man. Some of you had parents in your life that treated you Horrible. Some of you, stuff has just happened to you. There's been tragedy in your life. Some of you have lived outside of peace for as long as you have memory. And I just want to tell you today that I believe that there is a deliverance from that. And my prayer today is that you will begin a new path. I don't know what you've gone through, but I do know something. I know Jesus Christ. And Jesus has paid the price for you to live free. And I believe that today, you will pick your heart back up. You will take heart. You will reject the contrary voice. You will put aside the shame, the regret, the guilt, the pain the hurt and the brokenness of your past. And you'll say to your past, even if it wasn't your fault, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And like what Paul said, I forget those things which are behind me and I press on towards what God has for me. 
And you'll look at the disappointment and you'll say to it, I will not become sick because of you. And you'll pick your heart back up and you'll remember that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith. And there are times in life where you just have to fight the fight of faith. And you've got to look at the depression and the pain and the panic and the hurt with an attitude of indignation towards it. And you've got to respond as a child of the Most High God. And you've got to build into your life the peace of God. And every time the contrary voice comes, you say, no, devil, that's not who I am. I am not the tail, I'm the head. I am not weak, I am strong. I'm not a quitter, I will persevere. I'm not a failure, I will be victorious. And every time they try to put shame on you, you remind yourself, shame no more. I will not live like that anymore. Our family will not live like that anymore. And you've got to remember to fight every day. What are you fighting for? You're fighting for your peace. You're fighting for your marriage. You're fighting for your kids. Jared, everybody in my family is like this. How about you be the one to change it? How can you change it? By the power of the Most High God. And today's going to mark a new day in your life and your family. And you're not going to settle for what the devil has robbed you of. And joy, peace, and happiness is going to come back into your life. And you're going to go to bed with peace. You're going to wake up with light. And you're going to go forward with hope and with faith. And you will not be broken anymore. Because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, lives on the inside of you. And there's nothing you can do to change it. Stand to your feet. Now listen, I'm going to ask some of you to take a step of faith. Don't anybody go anywhere. Stay just a minute. I've invited the worship team. Some of you need this more than I can even imagine. I'm going to ask you, some of you to take a step of faith. I think there's something significant about coming to the altar of Jesus. There's something significant. And there's some of you that you need to leave some mess here today and walk out of here without it. So I'm going to ask you as we worship to get your stuff and come down here. Some of you will cry, you'll weep, you can get down on your knees before God and ask God to restore peace and clarity into your heart and mind. Some of your marriages, you need this. You're going to forgive each other down here today. And you're not going to live with the bitterness that you've had for 5, 10, 15 years in your marriage. You're going to leave here with joy and forgiveness. So get out and come down here. The worship team is going to start singing. And you just get your step and stuff and take a step of faith and come down here. And then I'm going to pray for you in a few moments. Come on, guys.